Chapter One of Windsor Castle, Book Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Windsor Castle, Book Two by William H. Ainsworth. Book Two, Hearn the Hunter, Chapter One. Of the compact between Sir Thomas Wyatt and Hearn the Hunter. On the day after his secret interview with Anne Boleyn, Sir Thomas Wyatt received dispatches from the King for the Court of France. His Majesty bade me tell you to make your preparations quickly, Sir Thomas, said the messenger who delivered the dispatches. He cares not how soon you set forth. The King's pleasure shall be obeyed, rejoined Wyatt and the messenger retired. Left alone, Wyatt remained for some time in profound and melancholy thought. Heaving a deep sigh, he then arose and paced the chamber with rapid strides. Yes, it is better thus, he ejaculated. If I remain near her, I shall do some desperate deed. Better, far better, I should go. And yet to leave her with Henry, to know that he is ever near her, that he drinks in the music of her voice, and basks in the sunshine of her smile, while I am driven forth to darkness and despair. The thought is madness. I will not obey the hateful mandate. I will stay and defy him. As he uttered aloud this wild and unguarded speech, the heiress screening the door was drawn aside and gave admittance to Wolsey. Wyatt's gaze sunk before the penetrating glance fixed upon him by the cardinal. I did not come to play the eavesdropper, Sir Thomas, said Wolsey, but I have heard enough to place your life in my power. So you refuse to obey the king's injunctions. You refuse to proceed to Paris. You refuse to assist in bringing about the divorce, and prefer remaining here to brave your sovereign and avenge yourself upon a fickle mistress. Ha! Huh. Wyatt returned no answer. If such be your purpose, pursued Wolsey, after a pause, during which he intently scrutinized the knight's countenance, I will assist you in it. Be ruled by me, and you shall have a deep and full revenge. Say on, rejoined Wyatt, his eyes blazing with infernal fire and his hand involuntarily clutching the handle of his dagger. If I read you aright, continued the cardinal, you are arrived at that pitch of desperation when life itself becomes indifferent, and when but one object remains to be gained. And that is vengeance, interrupted Wyatt fiercely. Right, cardinal, right. I will have vengeance, terrible vengeance. You shall but I will not deceive you. You will purchase what you seek at the price of your own head. I care not, replied Wyatt. All sentiments of love and loyalty are swallowed up by jealousy and burning hate. Nothing but blood can allay the fever that consumes me. Show me how to slay him. Him, echoed the cardinal in alarm and horror. Wretch, would you kill your king? God forbid that I should counsel the injury of a hair on his head. I do not want you to play the assassin, Wyatt, he added more calmly, but the just avenger. Liberate the king from the thraldom of the capricious siren who enslaves him, and you will do a service to the whole country. A word from you, a letter, a token, will cast her from the king and place her on the block. And what matter? The gory scaffold were better than Henry's bed. I cannot harm her, cried Wyatt distractedly. I love her still, devotedly as ever. She was in my power yesterday, and without your aid, Cardinal, I could have wreaked my vengeance upon her if I had been so minded. You were then in her chamber, as the king suspected, cried Wolsey with a look of exultation. Trouble yourself no more, Sir Thomas. I will take the part of vengeance off your hands. My indiscretion will avail you little, Cardinal, replied Wyatt sternly. A hasty word proves nothing. 
I will perish on the wreck sooner than accuse Anne Boleyn. I am a desperate man, but not so desperate as you suppose me. A moment ago I might have been led on by the murderous and traitorous impulse that prompted me to lift my hand against the king, but I never could have injured her. You are a madman, cried Wolsey impatiently, and it is a waste of time to argue with you. I wish you good speed on your journey. On your return you will find Anne Boleyn, Queen of England. And you disgraced, rejoined Wyatt, as, with a malignant and vindictive look, the cardinal quitted the chamber. Again left alone, Wyatt fell into another fit of despondency, from which he roused himself with difficulty, and went forth to visit the Earl of Surrey in the Round Tower. Some delay occurred before he could obtain access to the Earl. The halberdier stationed at the entrance to the keep near the Norman Tower refused to admit him without the order of the officer in command of the tower, and as the latter was not in the way at the moment, Wyatt had to remain without till he made his appearance. While thus detained, he beheld Anne Boleyn and her royal lover mount their steeds in the upper ward and ride forth with their attendants on a hawking expedition. Anne Boleyn wore a beautiful falcon on her wrist, Wyatt's own gift to her in happier days, and full of coquetry, animation, and delight, without the vestige of a cloud upon her brow or a care on her countenance. With increased bitterness of heart, he turned from the sight and shrouded himself beneath the gateway of the Norman Tower. Soon after this the officer appeared, and at once, according Wyatt permission to see the earl, preceded him up the long flight of stone steps communicating with the upper part of the keep, and screened by an embattled and turreted structure, constituting a covered way to the round tower. Arrived at the landing, the officer unlocked the door on the left, and ushered his companion into the prisoner's chamber. Influenced by this circular shape of the structure in which it was situated, and of which it formed a segment, the farther part of this chamber was almost lost to view, and a number of crossbeams and wooden pillars added to its somber and mysterious appearance. The walls were of enormous thickness, and a narrow loophole terminating a deep embrasure afforded but scanty light. Opposite the embrasure sat Surrey, at a small table covered with books and writing materials. A lute lay beside him on the floor, and there were several astrological and alchemical implements within reach. So immersed was the youthful prisoner in study that he was not aware, until a slight exclamation was uttered by Wyatt, of the entrance of the latter. He then arose and gave him welcome. Nothing material passed between them, as long as the officer remained in the chamber. But on his departure, Surrey observed laughingly to his friend, And how doth my fair cousin, the Lady Anne Boleyn? She has just ridden forth with the king to hawk in the park, replied Wyatt moodily. For myself I am ordered on a mission to France, but I could not depart without entreating your forgiveness for the jeopardy in which I have placed you. Would I could take your place. Do not heed me, replied Surrey. I am well content with what has happened. Virgil and Homer, Dante and Petrarch, are the companions of my confinement, and in good sooth I am glad to be alone. Amid the distractions of the court I could find little leisure for the muse. Your situation is, in many respects, enviable, Surrey, replied Wyatt. Disturbed by no jealous doubts and fears, you can beguile the tedious hours in the cultivation of your poetical tastes, or in study. Still, I must needs reproach myself with being the cause of your imprisonment. I repeat, you have done me a service, rejoined the earl. I would lay down my life for my fair cousin, Anne Boleyn, and I am glad to be able to prove the sincerity of my regard for you, Wyatt. I applaud the king's judgment in sending you to France, and if you will be counseled by me, you will stay there long enough to forget her who now occasions you 
so much uneasiness will the fair geraldine be forgotten when the term of your imprisonment shall expire my lord asked wyatt of a surety not replied the earl and yet in less than two months i shall return from france rejoined wyatt our cases are not alike said surrey the lady elizabeth fitzgerald has plighted her troth to me and boleyn vowed eternal constancy to me cried wyatt bitterly and you see how she kept her oath the absent are always in danger and few women are proof against ambition vanity vanity is the rock they split upon may you never experience from richmond the wrong i have experienced from his father i have no fear replied surrey as he spoke there was a slight noise in that part of the chamber which was buried in darkness have we a listener here cried wyatt grasping his sword not unless it be a four-legged one from the dungeons beneath replied surrey but you were speaking of richmond he visited me this morning and came to relate the particulars of a mysterious adventure that had occurred to him last night and the earl proceeded to detail what had befallen the duke in the forest a marvellous story truly said wyatt pondering upon the relation i will seek out the demon huntsman myself again a noise similar to that heard a moment before resounded from the lower part of the room wyatt immediately flew thither and drawing his sword searched about with its point but ineffectually it could not be fancy he said and yet nothing is to be found i do not like jesting about hern the hunter remarked surrey after what i myself have seen in your present frame of mind i advise you not to hazard an interview with the fiend he has power over the desperate wyatt returned no answer he seemed lost in gloomy thought and soon afterwards took his leave on returning to his lodgings he summoned his attendants and ordered them to proceed to kingston adding that he would join them there early the next morning one of them an old serving-man noticing the exceeding haggardness of his looks endeavoured to persuade him to go with them but wyatt with a harshness totally unlike his customary manner which was gracious and kindly in the extreme peremptorily refused you look very ill sir thomas said the old servant worse than i ever remember seeing you listen to my counsel i beseech you plead ill health with the king in excuse of your mission to france and retire for some months to recruit your strength and spirits at allington tush adam twisden i am well enough exclaimed wyatt impatiently go and prepare my mails my dear dear master cried old adam bending the knee before him and pressing his hand to his lips something tells me that if i leave you now i shall never see you again there is a paleness in your cheek and a fire in your eye such as i never before observed in you or in mortal man i tremble to say it but you look like one possessed by the fiend forgive my boldness sir i speak from affection and duty i was serving man to your father good sir henry wyatt before you and i love you as a son while i honour you as a master i have heard that there are evil beings in the forest nay even within the castle who lure men to perdition by promising to accomplish their wicked desires i trust no such being has crossed your path make yourself easy good adam replied wyatt no fiend has tempted me swear it sir cried the old man eagerly swear it by the holy trinity by the holy trinity i swear it replied wyatt as the words were uttered the door behind the heiress was suddenly shut with violence curses on you villain you have left the door open cried wyatt fiercely our conversation has been overheard i will soon see by whom cried adam springing to his feet and rushing toward the door which opened upon a long corridor well cried wyatt as adam returned the next moment with cheeks almost as white as his own was it the cardinal it was the devil i believe replied the old man i could see no one it would not require supernatural power to retreat into an adjoining chamber replied wyatt affecting an incredulity he was far from feeling 
your worship's adjuration was strangely interrupted cried the old man crossing himself devoutly st dunstan and st christopher shield us from evil spirits a truce to your idle terrors adam said wyatt take these packets he added giving him henry's dispatches and guard them as you would your life i am going on an expedition of some peril to-night and do not choose to keep them about me bid the grooms have my steed in readiness an hour before midnight i hope your worship is not about to ride into the forest at that hour said adam trembling i was told by the stout archer whom the king dubbed duke of shoreditch that he and the duke of richmond ventured thither last night and that they saw a legion of demons mounted on coal-black horses and amongst them mark fitton the butcher who was hanged a few days ago from the curfew tower by the king's order and whose body so strangely disappeared do not go into the forest dear sir thomas no more of this cried wyatt fiercely do as i bid you and if i join you not before noon to-morrow proceed to rochester and there await my coming i never expect to see you again sir groaned the old man as he took his leave the anxious concern evinced in his behalf by his old and trusty servant was not without effect on sir thomas wyatt and made him hesitate in his design but by and by another access of jealous rage came on and overwhelmed all his better resolutions he remained within his chamber to a late hour and then issuing forth proceeded to the terrace at the north of the castle where he was challenged by a sentinel but was suffered to pass on on giving the watchword the night was profoundly dark and the whole of the glorious prospect commanded by the terrace shrouded from view but wyatt's object in coming thither was to gaze for the last time at that part of the castle which enclosed anne boleyn and knowing well the situation of her apartments he fixed his eyes upon the windows but although numerous lights streamed from the adjoining corridor all here was buried in obscurity suddenly however the chamber was illumined and he beheld henry and anne boleyn enter it preceded by a band of attendants bearing tapers it needed not wyatt's jealousy sharpened gaze to read even at that distance the king's enamoured looks or anne boleyn's responsive glances he saw that one of henry's arms encircled her waist while the other caressed her yielding hand they paused henry bent forward and anne half averted her head but not so much as to prevent the king from imprinting a long and fervid kiss upon her lips terrible was its effect upon wyatt an adder's bite would have been less painful his hands convulsively clutched together his hair stood erect upon his head a shiver ran through his frame and he tottered back several paces when he recovered henry had bidden good night to the object of his love and having nearly gained the door turned and waved a tender valediction to her as soon as he was gone anne looked round with a smile of ineffable pride and pleasure at her attendants but a cloud of curtains dropping over the window shrouded her from the sight of her wretched lover in a state of agitation wholly indescribable wyatt staggered towards the edge of the terrace it might be with the design of flinging himself from it but when within a few yards of the low parapet wall defending its precipitous side he perceived a tall dark figure standing directly in his path and halted whether the object he beheld was human or not he could not determine but it seemed of more than mortal stature it was wrapped in a long black cloak and wore a high conical cap on its head before wyatt could speak the figure addressed him you desire to see herne the hunter said the figure in a deep sepulchral tone ride hence to the haunted beech tree near the marsh at the farther side of the forest and you will find him you are herne i feel it cried wyatt why go into the forest speak now and he stepped forward with the intention of grasping the figure but it eluded him and with a mocking laugh melted into the darkness wyatt advanced to the edge of the terrace and looked over the parapet 
but he could see nothing except the tops of the tall trees springing from the side of the moat flying to the sentinel he inquired whether any one had passed him but the man returned an angry denial awe-stricken and agitated wyatt quitted the terrace and seeking his steed mounted him and galloped into the forest if he i have seen be not indeed the fiend he will scarcely outstrip me in the race he cried as his steed bore him at a furious pace up the long avenue the gloom was here profound being increased by the dense masses of foliage beneath which he was riding by the time however that he reached the summit of snow hill the moon struggled through the clouds and threw a wan glimmer over the leafy wilderness around the deep slumber of the woods was unbroken by any sound save that of the frenzied rider bursting through them well acquainted with the forest wyatt held on a direct course his brain was on fire and the fury of his career increased his fearful excitement heedless of all impediments he pressed forward now dashing beneath overhanging boughs at the risk of his neck now skirting the edge of a glen where a false step might have proved fatal on on he went his frenzy increasing each moment at length he reached the woody height overlooking the marshy tract that formed the limit of his ride once more the moon had withdrawn her lustre and a huge indistinct black mass alone pointed out the position of the haunted tree around it wheeled a large white owl distinguishable by its ghostly plumage through the gloom like a seabird in a storm and hooting bodingly as it winged its mystic flight no other sound was heard nor living object seen while gazing into the dreary expanse beneath him wyatt for the first time since starting experienced a sensation of doubt and dread and the warning of his old and faithful attendant rushed upon his mind he tried to recite a prayer but the words died away on his lips neither would his fingers fashion the symbol of a cross but even these admonitions did not restrain him springing from his foaming and panting steed and taking the bridle in his hand he descended the side of the acclivity ever and anon a rustling among the grass told him that a snake with which description of reptile the spot abounded was gliding away from him his horse which had hitherto been all fire and impetuosity now began to manifest symptoms of alarm quivered in every limb snorted and required to be dragged along forcibly when within a few paces of the tree its enormous rifted trunk became fully revealed to him but no one was beside it wyatt then stood still and cried in a loud commanding tone spirit i summon thee appear at these words a sound like a peal of thunder rolled overhead accompanied by screeches of discordant laughter other strange and unearthly noises were heard and amidst the din a blue phosphoric light issued from the yawning crevice in the tree while a tall gaunt figure crested with an antlered helm sprang from it at the same moment a swarm of horribly grotesque swart objects looking like imps appeared amid the branches of the tree and grinned and gesticulated at wyatt whose courage remained unshaken during the fearful ordeal not so his steed after rearing and plunging violently the affrighted animal broke its hold and darted off into the swamp where it floundered and was lost you have called me sir thomas wyatt said the demon in a sepulchral tone i am here what would you my name being known to you spirit of darkness my errand should be also replied wyatt boldly your errand is known to me replied the demon you have lost a mistress and would regain her i would give my soul to win her back from my kingly rival cried wyatt i accept your offer rejoined the spirit anne boleyn shall be yours your hand upon the compact wyatt stretched forth his hand and grasped that of the demon 
His fingers were compressed, as if by a vice, and he felt himself dragged towards the tree, while a stifling and sulphurous vapor rose around him. A black veil fell over his head, and was rapidly twined around his brow in thick folds. Amid yells of fiendish laughter, he was then lifted from the ground, thrust into the hollow of the tree, and thence, as it seemed to him, conveyed into a deep subterranean cave. End of chapter 1